introduction. Uh, I'll just talk about how much of a pleasure it is for, for us to have James here with us to share his story. Uh, I, the story that actually comes behind us getting James here is kind of strange because uh, myself and Carol White, who was actually the previous MBA president, she's doing study abroad. Last semester we were sitting back and we were just talking about this event for this year and what are we going to do? We're not sure who we can get to speak and what kind of event will we have. And it really just, out of nowhere, came together uh, at big part thanks to Christine Robinson. See, there you go. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, we uh, worked with Christine very early on and she reached out to us and, and through her we were actually able to get James to come down here and we're, we're very pleased to have him here. Uh, so with that, I, I will mention that uh, James is, uh, is a recent recipient of the Frederick Douglass Freedom Award by the Templeton Foundation. And uh, that award, from, from what I recall reading, is, is all about those who have actually previously been in slavery and have now devoted their lives or devoted themselves to continue to fight the fight of slavery. Uh, and another award that he also received recently was uh, the, the Greenwood College 2011 Young Innovator of Social Justice Award in Iowa. Uh, he was honored for that. And uh, we are also very honored. I won't give you too much of his background because I would love for him to share his own story in his own words. And uh, with that, I'd like to invite James up. No, I'm OK. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, at the time you were calling, I was still being wired with the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I do truly appreciate your company. Um, I would like to, before I start anything, I would like to acknowledge a few people. Um, my colleague, Jesse, if you are here. Jesse works with Hobby Foundation. And she's been taking me around for all this uh, program. So, Jesse, I really appreciate you. I also want to thank the organizers of this program, um, the Black MBA Association, for the honor done me for inviting me for this program. I must also thank uh, Sherry and Rebecca for uh, your immense contribution towards bringing me here. Uh, if you are here, yeah, good, thank you. <laughs> then the uh, Globe-based student uh, leadership, uh, Christine, Scott, Lisa, thank you so much for all the help that you've given me so far and uh, driving me around and making sure that uh, I feel comfortable. Um, I believe that I have to recognize my other colleagues here, Dave, Emmanuel, and Raphael. They are here. Yeah, they are also taking part in the Globase uh, partnership. They are also from Ghana. And I say thank you very much for your company for the last few days that we've been together. It's been an enjoyable time that we have shared, networked, and I believe that it's a memorable time for me. Thank you so much. Um, I know that we have various global-based teams here. Uh, my own team is here. Uh, I don't want to start mentioning it, otherwise I'll just forget one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I truly acknowledge your presence here, and I look forward to your company in Ghana to share Ghanaian hospitality, as you might have read about it. Now, I know that we have a few minutes to share together here. And therefore, it's not everything that we can talk about. So I will lead you to please look for us on our website, challengeheights.org, or like us on our Facebook so that you can continue to receive updates from the work that we do. So that if I leave anything else or of course, I'm going to leave a lot of things out. You will then be updated on what we do. Having said that, I want to start by telling a very short story. My first ever international award came from my own 
former employees, Barclays Bank. And I was invited in to go to London to receive this award. Very massive crowd, almost 2,000 people coming from all walks of life, banks, you know, the multinationals. And one woman, once I was sitting there, one woman came to ask me, so are you also coming from Africa? I said, yes. Oh, OK. Do you know Kojo? <laughs> you know, Kojo actually comes from Ghana. Kojo is a male born on Monday. So if you are born on Monday and you are a male, then you are called Kojo. Now, he didn't, she didn't even ask me where in Africa I came from. But she just wanted to know whether I know Kojo. <laughs> and we are only seven days in a week. So there should be, Ghana population is about 24 million. So there should be at least some 3 million Kojos in Ghana. <laughs> Very interesting. So I had to take the opportunity to explain to her what Kojo mean, meant. I know that in a lot of cases when there are people who have heard of you and what you have achieved and done and awards and all of that, then there are serious expectations of what you can do when you come to stand behind the podium to speak to them. So I'm sure the expectations of my eloquence is up there. But I'm, I'm your brother, you are my brother, you are my sister. So we are just going to talk as friends, as brothers. I, I just want you to know that I am learning how we can discuss issues of national, international, local importance. So let's work together with that expectation and we shall all be fine. I, I've done a few things, but I'm sure one of the things, the reasons why you brought me here is the testament that I have to tell about what has happened to me in the past as a child how I had utilized that experience for the benefit of myself, my community, and mankind. That I believe is what has inspired a lot of us here to come and listen to how it happened. Sometimes when I look back, I ask myself, how did this happen? Because it's tons and tons of episodes of tribulation, of pain, of joy, and of triumph. And I'm glad to say that it was good, it ended well. It ends well when it is well. I come from a family of 12 children of my mother, and all of them, with the exception of myself, were illiterate. Of course, my parents were also illiterate. And I come from a community which was full of illiteracy. The community which has been affected so much by trafficking, especially internal trafficking in Ghana. A fishing community and a farming community where children are guaranteed an experience of trafficking. And as a growing up child, almost every single home in the community I came from was affected by trafficking, including my own home. Children, boys and girls. So when I was six years old, the story was to be continued with me. When in as innocent as I was, I was also sold into the same circumstances which my brothers and sisters also had to experience. I work in more than 20 communities along the coast of Lake Volta. Some of you might have read about Lake Volta, but it, 
Let me paint a very small picture. It is by far the largest man-made lake in the world. It was created in the early 1960s with the aim of creating an hydro dam to power our electrification projects in the country. The size that was anticipated became more than that. I mean, the lake became so huge. Tens of hundreds of times of how the lake was anticipated. So there was a booming fishing business as a result of this overflowing of this lake. And fishing businesses who were then fishing along the coast took advantage of it. Initially, they were employing adults. But later, when they realized that the stock of fish in the lake was getting smaller and smaller, they were looking for ways of minimizing cost and maximizing profit. Therefore, children became the victims of their business. And they employed several hundreds of children. They recruited them from the coastal areas and sent them to the lake to work. And that is what I fell victim to. And I work from age six until I escaped age 13. That cumulative seven years was full of abuse and pain and work. Starting my work typically from 3 a.m. and ending 8 p.m. And within that 3 a.m. and 8 p.m. was full of activities. Pushing canoe, mending nets, being forced under the lake to remove trap nets, removing fishes, scooping water from the boats. Everything minion that you can think of, I was forced to do it. And with that, my reward was one meal a day. That hard work. And in fact, I was not expected to make a mistake, even as young as that. I'm sure you know that even your small children in the house, when they go to school and they are giving homework, when they are doing it, they are doing their homework, they could make a mistake, even with pen and paper. And when they make a mistake, they just cancel and rewrite it or erase it and rewrite. My portion was that I was not expected to make a mistake. And any time I made a mistake, the visitation of abuse and torture sometimes made me feel like I was less than a human being. And of course, as a child, definitely I'll make a mistake. So I did make them hourly, daily, weekly, monthly. So if I rip at my strip, which I wouldn't do, you will see the testimonies of abuse, the marks of torture. Beside these physical issues where trauma, as I speak to you now, even still, I still live with some of the remnants of the psychosocial problems that I went through as a child when I was working there. And always, constantly, because of that endurance of pain, and the fact that as a human being, definitely you will want to escape for, from such pains. I attempted several times to escape. But the consequences of attempting to escape was even more than the pain that I was enduring. And that was to serve as deterrent to other children who would want to escape. I remember there was once, the first time I attempted to escape, it was because I had been forced to go and remove trap nets. 
and I had been trapped under the lake in a very bizarre circumstances. And you know, this diving, you don't use any breathing aid. So you go raw, you have to strip and go raw and come raw. And whilst I'm removing the entangled net, I realized I'd been trapped. And I, would, I realized it at a time when I was just about to come up. And just when I know that if I don't go at this moment, it's likely that I'll lose my breath. So, knowing the consequences of tearing the net and knowing that I was faced with life and death, I tore the net that had trapped me. And with the speed that I could mash at that moment, I just hit the ground. And, and the lake is very deep, very, very deep, very, so deep. Some of my colleagues here know what I'm talking about. At the time I was diving, and as per the skills and experience I had gathered on the lake was working, I know how I had to dive. So the boat that we were using was lying this way, and the net had been trapped this way. So the boat was like this, trapped this way. So as per the experience, I know how to dive from here. So that when I'm coming, I have to come from the same spot where I dived. I, from. So with that speed and the fact that I was almost losing my breath, little did I know that the current of the lake had changed. And therefore, the boat has moved from its original path to where I was coming from. And with all the speed, I just carried the boat like it with my head. And that is all I could remember. And as I began to regain consciousness, I saw so many people around me, just like you are here, looking at me and with smiles on their faces, just small smiles, as if some, they've seen or heard some good news. And it's no. And I realized, no. Where am I? With blood oozing all over my body. And I saw smokes going into my nose. No access to medical care. And therefore, when I passed, uh, when I, that incident happened, and they realized that I felt unconscious, they brought me to the shore, and Ben Pepe, I mean, you know Pepe, this spicy Pepe that you use for cooking, they put fire on it, burn it, put it very close to my nose, so that I will inhale the smoke. And that was my medical care. They thought that by doing that, that will revive me. Yes, luckily for me, I was revived. But the reviver brought in me another reviver. The agency for me to live. The realization that if I don't live and I spend more time there, I could die. Dawn on me all of a sudden. And I was determined as I would lie there and looked at them and pretend as if I was smiling, I was determined to escape from the clutches of enslavement. And that determination just did not remain in my mind or my head, but I translated it into Practical action, tempted to escape. But unfortunately for me, there was no access to escape. The same boat that would go to the community where I was once a week, and the, the next opportunity is the following week, that is the same boat that will carry my master to the market. So I only escaped into my master's hand. And when I was caught, that was hell. They just, you know, you see the rope that you use to tow a vehicle. 
the nylon triple twine rope, the big one. They made a noose out of it and then you know, put it on my neck and tied it, touching it, and pulled me around the community. Just pulled me violently, and I had the much less stuff. Pulled me violently around the community. As if I was a goat. Even, I'm sure some animals have more dignity. That was to serve as a deterrent to other children who would like to escape. And I have seen examples of that in the past. And so that deterrent behavior, deterrent action, did not deter me. So I determined and, and continued to attempt to escape until finally it paid off. I was lucky to escape. But you know what? When I was being trafficked, we were six children who were trafficked together. The six of us who were trafficked together the same day, who were sold together the same day, only three of us survived. Those three who survived, myself and two others, I was the only person who got educate, ed educated. The rest, two did not get any education. In fact, the other three all died out of the work. That is how serious it is. And when we are talking about this modern day slavery, we are not talking about any lofty thing that you cannot, you cannot understand. It is the word, the sense of the word slavery. If I cannot walk away, if I don't have a voice, if I don't have any right, if I can live in fear because somebody is controlling me, if somebody can torture me to, to any extent at will, if I'm not paid for any work that I do, if I, not, I cannot determine my salary or my wages, totally dominated, then of course, that will fit the definition of slavery. Now, after finally escaping, I, no, I've told you all the things and you know, things that happen negatively and so on and so forth. But the question I asked myself after escaping at the age of 30 was, what next? Coming home to meet a mother who was sick, who was happy to receive me, but at that time was bedridden and sick. A father who was so hostile to me, in a position to help, but so hostile to me, because I disobeyed him by running away from my master and having influenced the whole community to reject me because I disobeyed him. And by cultural and traditional dynamics, if you disobey your parents in a community, in our setting, you have disobeyed the entire community. And therefore, the entire community thrown upon me, seeing me as an outcast. So at the age of 13, not having anybody to take care of me, even the food to eat, I had to put myself in school. Of course, that was the only option for me. And I was determined to do it, to go to school, because I saw it as the ultimate solution to all the pains and impoverishment and exploitation that I and other children had gone through. So yes, with the skills that I had gained from the fishing business, I worked as a fisherman in my own coastal community, and at the same time went to school to pay for my fees. Those years of elementary school, senior high school, and so on and so forth, they were long years. Long years of hunger. Still enduring days without food. Of choosing between hunger and nothing. There were days when I wished an adult, any adult at all, would have just come to me to say, James, for everything that you need, I don't care about it. But I will care about one thing. Let me take care of your feeding each day. 
I just yearn for somebody to give me one meal a day. Was planning to study, worrying about books, and so on and so forth. I was also worried about food. Because nobody to take care of me. But I'm narrating this portion of it for you to know that no circumstance can deter any one of us, me, you, or anybody, if we are determined. Through it all, and with all the, the, the deprivation, I was able to make it. I set a record in my school, and that record is still there unbroken. One of the highest records that you can ever think of in that local community. Even not in that community, in the whole district. Went to high school, did very well, went to the university, did very well. All by paying for myself. Now I've finished school. Good news. That's what you want. You've gotten what you want. Then I got a job. Good job. Barclays Bank of Ghana. Wow. Not many people will get that opportunity in Ghana. You only, you know, you dream of some jobs. But that one is the aspirations of the brick. Those who really, you know, score high marks and have connections and so on and so forth. But that, here was I. Not knowing anybody and so on and so forth, I've gotten a job. Good money, good pay. Very soon I was a manager. What next? I'm sure you have by now read that to whom much is given, much is expected. And that is the motto of my organization, Challenging Heights. That is the basis for the formation of Challenging Heights. That never again would I or anybody sit down to see other children impoverished, enslaved, and never do anything about it. And I stood at a very advantageous position, having known the difference between being abused and having opportunities in life to be free. Witnessing enslavement firsthand and witnessing prosperity myself should be an advocate. So Challenging Heights was born out of that passion, drive, motivation to see to it that we will not sit down for other people out of greed to dominate the freedoms and aspirations of others. There are so many children who are, whose talents have been wasted. As I stand here, I now have a master's degree. I do a lot of things. That is the talent. Just imagine if I had not escaped to go to school. What talent the world would have lost? And how many of such talents are still being wasted? So we started Challenging Height. When I started, I used 60% of my salary towards it. I, I thought I was just trying to contribute back. So I, I didn't even form anything. I didn't know anything about charities, about NGOs, nothing. I just wanted to solve a problem. So 60%, my employers, take it, let's do this. And as I we continue with rescuing children one child at a time, one community at a time, the work began to expand and expand until we registered it in 2005 when we opened it up for others to contribute. Today, since we started Challenging Heights in 2003, We've offered support to over 10,000 children, many of whom were rescued from slavery, some of whom were prevented from being enslaved. Year on year. Yeah, you can go ahead.
Thank you. Year in year, we support an average of 1,000 children. Last year, we supported 1,420 children. 37 of them were rescued from slavery. And we believe that such is what we have been able to do so far. But briefly on some of the things that may, we may have to address our minds to. Oftentimes, we go to school to acquire knowledge, skills. The aim of these acquisitions is uh, to make life better for ourselves and our society. Oftentimes, when we are employed at places, we believe that we are working for our employers. I believe in one thing, and you don't have to agree with my belief. You can be an entrepreneur within any employment of your choice. Assuming you are employed in a bank, being directed and led by a group of people, you can still, within the context of this procedural activity every day, you can still become an entrepreneur. Wherever we are. I'm saying this because whatever I have done with this organization so far, I've always looked at the sustainability of it. My community, communities that we serve, how are the children there going to be or how are they going to fare tomorrow when I'm not there? Am I supposed to always be there providing, telling them what to do or providing the leadership? What about helping them to become leaders themselves within the context of their being led? So we build sustainability models in our work, ensuring that everybody who benefits from our project follows our motto of to whom much is given, much is expected. You go through benefits from our services, you go through school, graduate, gain employment or employ yourself, contribute back to the society so that I don't always have to come and do the contribution. Today, as I speak to you now, the programs manager of Challenging Heights is a past beneficiary of Challenging Heights. He is more, even now more knowledgeable than myself. So brilliant. Proud of him. Almost all our uniforms that we have in our school, and we have several schools, are sewn by benef past beneficiaries of our program. Our program's officers, teachers, a lot of them have been beneficiaries when they were children. That is sustainability. I invite you to think about it. That what can we do collectively to ensure that slavery will, will end once more in our lifetime. We didn't have the opportunity in the past to be part of the movement to emancipate those days of transatlantic slaves. But we have a unique opportunity now to ensure that we imprint our name in the committee of movement, in the list of people who worked towards the emancipation of modern day slavery. And we have over 27 million slaves worldwide, according to the experts. In the US, in Europe, in Africa, everywhere they are there. Brothels, cocoa industry, fishing industry, everywhere they are there. It will take you and I to make an impact for the freedom of these people. Then we can say, Yes, we have overcome. Thank you.
Vielen Dank, Christian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we actually have a microphone over here because we'd like to open it up for a few questions. Yeah, sure. We'll take uh, a few questions over here if anybody has them. Just feel free to step right over and uh, ask away. Okay, I'll start with one then. <laughs> and no need to raise your hand, you can just come right over and ask it. Uh, James, I'd, I'd like you, if you could, just to touch upon some of the recent experiences that you've seen, maybe some of the uh, recent ones that you've encountered as you've been continuing your fight to, to end human trafficking, slavery, over in, uh, in Africa and everywhere else. Maybe if you could touch on some of the forms that you've seen, maybe things that were a little different than what you've experienced, and, and how you've managed to get some of these uh, children and people out of slavery. Okay, I, um, I'll touch on the known. So I'll talk about um, last uh, few, I say, barely a year ago, we had a case of two children who were sold by their parents for $65. In fact, it's 80 Ghana cities. When you convert it, it's about $65. Both of them, one was seven years, the other one was nine years. Siblings, boys, both of them were sold for $65. And the agreement between the masters and the parents was that the children were going to work for two years to pay off that debt. After two years, this child was not brought back. The parent persistently complained that the children should be brought back. But the fisherman said no. At the time she was taking the children, he said they were too young to work at, at their maximum. So now was the time for them to work. He refused several times. The case was reported to us. We went in several times. I personally went there myself. Trick, took a trip, our 10, 11 hours trip to the lake and took about four more hours of boats ride to the community and still refused. So we had to bring in the police. It is only when, that, that is when we bring in the police. We brought the police and the man was arrested. Uh, the man and the wife who, was, who were enslaving the children were arrested. And we pursued the case and the case went to court and, and they were jailed. That is why when you read the internet and all that, you see that I have faced a lot of death threats. That is, the, that is the case. Now, this is the typical situation where children are actually purchased, in quotes, purchased for a period of time. Their value, values are negotiated and paid for, and they work for that period of time, of course, always extended until they themselves either escape, die, or they become adults, and they too enslave others you know, to perpetuate a cycle. So this is the typical you know, mode of the enslavement in the industry that I work. Yes. Yes, um, this, is, this, is, this is seen as a, an African problem or European problem, but I was sure I, I, I know like that they get that the slaves get imported into the United States for lack of a better or I mean for lack of a humane word. Um, how 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 many slaves are in the United States right now? And I've even heard that there are slaves in this very community. Um, so, do you know the numbers on the slavery in the United States or the, the situation as it is today? Okay, thank you. I, I'm wondering whether my, my knowledge about the United States will be accurate, but I know that 
250 or 25,000, 250,000 or 25,000 uh, slaves in America. I will refer you to read this book, Slaves Next Door. Slaves Next Door, written by Kevin Bills. It catalogs the number of slaves in America. And let me add quickly that the problem is not an African problem. Assuming without admitting that in the United States we don't have slaves here, even that, it will, it will not be an African problem. Because you see, when we do nothing about what happens in our neighboring communities, we live in our comfort, but our comfort will be short-lived. Because the world has become a very small place. If you are talking about 27 million slaves, you are talking about some of them who have been prostituted, like they've been thrown into forced prostitution. You're talking about some of them who have been forced to work in restaurants. Some of them who have, whose passports have been taken away from them and have been forced to work against their will. And it could be unknown to you that you will go and employ such victims. The law in the United States and elsewhere all says that both the employer, the transporter, and the one who traffic the victim are all guilty. So it's not the problems, this problem somewhere else is not the, that place's problem. It's the problem of everyone. Because once you employ an illegal person who has been, somebody who has been um, tortured or who has been trafficked, you are also liable. So let's look at it from that perspective. In Ghana, for instance, I can say that we have over 240,000, according to our last census statistics, it's about 240,000 children who are caught up in enslavement or trafficking. I don't know about Europe. But these are some of the figures that we're dealing with. And it could well mean that even just beside your, your house, there's a slave living there that you don't know. If you read this book, Not For Sale, it will tell you how he started his organization, how he discovered that he was buying always from a, rest, a particular restaurant, he was always buying from a slave. He didn't know. It was only a circumstance that revealed that that person was a slave. So you may be buying from somebody who needs your help. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for sharing your story with us on the spotlight this problem. Um, I have two questions. Uh, number one is at the community level. Mentioned the parents selling kids to start with. Uh, what is being done to educate uh, the community and the environment as to the danger and the outcome of what happens when that kid is sent away? And number two, at the country level, government level, you mentioned uh, kept going back for the police officers and having action taken that way. What responsibility lies in the hand of the authority because they know what's happening? They're aware of it at a certain level, and what is being done when it comes to that. So one's community-wise, and the other one governmental. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I will take the last question first. The countrywide, I think we've made a lot of progress. Uh, we passed the Children's Act in 1998. We passed the Human Trafficking Act in 2005. We were the, one of the first countries to ratify the UN Convention on the Right of the Child. We are also uh, signatories to most of the ILO conventions, Convention 131, Convention 183, and most of the optional protocols that uh, the UN has. In fact, we are also signatories to the Palermo Protocol, which was agreed upon in Italy in the year 2000. So in terms of legislative regime, Ghana has done so much well. I mean, 
creating the environment for us to fight this, this problem. In fact, recently I was part of the team that drafted our national plan of action against exploitation of, of children. So that is also there at that national level. Now we also have institutional framework because once you have the legal regime, you also have to have the institutions to um, ensure that this legal regime also work. So we have the human trafficking unit or anti-human trafficking unit of the Ghana Police Service. We have the Women and Children Affairs Ministry. We have the National Commission on you know, Children. We have so many other um, institutions that protect children against trafficking. Uh, so these are the efforts that government is taking. My challenge, and that has been my problem with our government, and of course that is why I step on very big toes always, has been that the implementation of all of these things have been lacking. You know, so because if you have passed a law and you have set up institutions, you need to empower them to be able to implement the law. What is, what is the use of a law if a policeman who has been mandated by the law to arrest a trafficker and to give the victim to an institution like Ministry of Women's and Children's Affairs, does the arrest, give the victim to the Women and Children's Affairs, but the Women and Children's Affairs does not have anything, any facility or services to provide for this victim. So it falls on me, the NGO, or the organization, to protect that child or that victim. It means, it means we are going nowhere. So that has been my problem. So in most cases, last, just last week, we got a, a trafficker arrested. The trafficker just sold a child, and the social welfare institution, which is mandated in providing recovery and protection services for these children, rather called Challenging Heights to come and help them protect these children. That, that is wrong. That, that should be the opposite. We should see the victims, report to them, and they protect them. So that has been my problem. But yes, in terms of um, uh, the steps that the country is taking, I think they've done well. And I will commend the steps that are taken by America, coming out with the TIFS report, the uh, Trafficking in Persons report every year, to ensure that they put pressure on government to do the right thing. I, I'm, I'm thrilled by that. The second question is about awareness. Most of uh, our programs are really comprehensive. Everything we do as an organization is imbued with awareness raising, awareness creation, educating communities, individuals, and groups to know their rights and to know how they should protect children. So even the children we rescue before we reintegrate them, we put them in a recovery program train them on how to protect their rights, train their families on how to protect their own rights and the rights of their children, and educate those families about the value of education. So it's very, very comprehensive. In fact, we show pictures of how the children are abused, we show videos of how we, we rescue the children in the situations that we find them, and so on and so forth. So it's a very measured approach towards total elimination. Otherwise, what is going to happen is that you spend a lot of money rescuing and others will be thrown into it. So we always work to cut the flow whilst we rescue those who are already in. That's how I work and we have been successful in doing that. Okay. I was wondering, um, you told a lot about how, um, how you felt about um, slavery, but um, when, when, once you figured out that this is what you wanted to do with your life, what were the steps that you went through to actually start your organization? Thank you. And I think I'll invite one more question, and then that will be it. Is that right? Thank you. I, I didn't take a decision to start my organization. I mean, that is being frank. It was a natural sequence of events. I was always burning with the edge, the, I was always burning with the motivation, the intrinsic edge to do something about the situation. <coughs> Sorry. So when I finished high school, 
I realized one thing in my community, the children were not going to school and they were all candidates for trafficking. And one of the things that I thought of at that time was, I think 18, there about, or 19. And I, I saw that those children were not going to school or most of them had dropped out of school because they couldn't have the facilities to learn even when they come from school. There was no electricity in the community. So I mobilized the youth in the community to raise resources locally to bring electricity in that community. I just saw it, that no, this is wrong. And me being the only person who has been able to go through secondary school and the only person who has the prospect of going to the university, I felt that I had an obligation to do what I was doing. So I had so many followers and we did it. After I went through sec the secondary school and the university and then finished, it was just natural. I, I just saw that something was wrong. If something is wrong, don't you see that it's wrong? Can't you see? Something was definitely wrong. And, you know, it was like, I was somehow, sometimes I feel frustrated. You no, know, we need to change things. That was it. So it was a one-man movement. One-man campaign of wanting to change, make the change in the communities. And pleasantly for me, any time I lifted a hand, I had other hands being lifted in support. The children, the women, the community members, everybody was ready. And they, when I explained issues, then they saw that, yes, something must be done. So, but I, need, I know that you cannot just do things by word of mouth. And that is why I had to in order to ensure that they feel the practical impact of the value of education, I had to lead the way by sacrificing my personal earnings towards the course. So that everybody will know that it pays to sacrifice to put those children in school. And eventually, when they saw that gradually amongst them, I was putting children in school, I was putting children in school, and they saw that my lifestyle at, was was an example and a change for them, they saw that if they also send their children to school, or the children themselves saw that if they also go to school, they'll have a brighter future. So identification of myself as what value education can bring to an individual, how an individual can change society, change himself and his family. So that was movement. So it culminated into that movement that I call Challenging Heights. So I always say Challenging Heights, just not, it's not an organization, it's just a platform, Challenging Heights, to give them a platform, the children a platform to be heard, the communities, the platform to express themselves and to say no to trafficking, exploitation, and enslavement. I only give it, gave it a name because I first later on that I was being overwhelmed by the needs of that movement. So after registering, then other people started coming in. So everything that you see here today, or everything you see about Challenging Height, is actually an eruption that has come out of a burning desire to make a change. And it's still the same until every child receives a basic education, I see that any educated person is a sacrificial lamp for my community. And I should be the first person to be sacrificed so that others will feel okay when they are sacrificing. So that's how Chalanya came to about. I didn't really want to, like I didn't start it, that I want to start an organization. Hi James, my name is Tim and I wanted to thank you again for uh, coming here and sharing your story and also answering our questions. Uh, definitely very inspirational. Um, and my question is, kind of like you, I think most of us here, we, we look at, at slavery, we look at the modern day trafficking, we think this is wrong, we want to change something. Uh, but it's also something that we feel maybe very distant about. Um, it's something we read about, we hear about, but we don't feel like we can do anything to change it. What would you suggest to us, you know, practically speaking, on a daily basis, what can we do to combat modern-day slavery and deal with human trafficking. Thank you for being my last questioner. 
the first thing you can do, spread the word. Just spread the word. Talk about it. Read about it. Get information. In Africa, we have a saying that if you want to hide something from an African, you put it in a book. And, and give the book to, to him or okay. her. You will not read it. But please read about it. Ask questions. Research on it. Gain knowledge. And tell people. That is the first step. Because the more we create awareness, the more people become aware and protect themselves. Sometimes you may be in a situation of slavery, but you may not know. If you have information, you will know. The other thing that we can do is to promote the movement. Promote the movement. What can you contribute towards the movement, towards the emancipation of others who are found in slavery? Attendance here is one of them. Asking other people to attend other programs. I go to places to speak. If you invite me, I'll come. I go to churches, I go to universities to speak. And I started by saying you can also like in us on Facebook. It's one of the ways to get information because we update ourselves regularly about issues that are happening around the world in terms of slavery and so on and so forth. If you have liked us, you will hear more. But it's also very important to contribute. Yes, because I cannot pretend that we don't need money to do the work we are doing. We need it. We need it. To rescue one child, it costs us at least $400. To educate one child for a year, it costs us at least $240. It costs us a lot of money to do what we are doing. So I will not pretend we need money. So you can contribute. In fact, you don't have to contribute to challenging high, though that is my number one. <laughs> but feel free to contribute to the course, whatever you are led to do. That way, you will feel that you played your part. And if I play my part, you play your part, then together, playing our parts, we will say, yes, we did it. Thank you so much, and I appreciate your audience.